members. Chris Powell joined the Libertarian Party in 2000 and has served as state chair as well as being the OKLP's most successful candidate, receiving over 89,000 votes for Oklahoma County Clerk in 2000. In 2016, beating the Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson's statewide total of 83,841. Powell has successfully promoted legislation that expanded public access to vital records and helped lead to the creation of an online index available to the public, was a plaintiff in challenging Oklahoma's election law in Beaver versus Klingman that was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court and has had multiple opinion pieces published. That was tough. Multiple <laughs> opinion pieces published in the Daily Oklahoman and at LewRockwell.com. Powell lives in Bethany with his wife and three children. Please join me in welcoming Chris Powell, the Libertarian Party candidate. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate being here, and I appreciate the Tulsa 912 Project uh, not only hosting me, but uh, this being part of a series of trying to introduce us schools running for this office to people who are going to be voting. Uh, I don't know how many of you are registered libertarians uh, that would be able to vote for me in the primary. You do still have until March 31st to change your registration if you'd like to do that. Uh, but of course, there will be a libertarian candidate. Uh, I'm planning on it being me on the general election ballot in November. And that's certainly something that uh, all of you will have the option to consider uh, with it being a general election. Uh, as uh, Wanda said, my name is Chris Powell. I'm a libertarian running for governor. I grew up in Choctaw and did, uh, did a stint in the Marine Corps, was in the first Gulf War. So I'm a veteran like I see many of you are here as well. Uh, I got married. Uh, in 94 and 96, we moved to Bethany, and we've kind of been there ever since. Uh, I'm employed by the Oklahoma City Police Department handling uh, evidence for them. Currently, I handle the uh, firearms for the department that are in evidence. And I've been a libertarian since 2000. Uh, since I'm here in Tulsa, uh, I'll, go, uh, I'll go ahead and point out that my hobby for many, many years has been genealogy. And I've done research in all parts of the state, and I've been up here in this area a lot. My great-grandparents are, uh, and uh, great-uncle Bluford are buried in Bixby. Uh, I've got a uh, cousin, uh, Todd White, that's a pastor down in Sepulpa. So I've, I've never lived in this part of the state, but I've been up here a lot, and uh, it's always been a really fun place to, to come to. Uh, I have a particularly fond memory of coming up here with my wife. This was before we were married to, to go to a club to see the dead milkman. I'm sure there's lots of dead milkman fans here in the audience today. So I'm running for governor, and some of the things that, that I'm interested in that I think the people of this state are interested in uh, one of probably the, one of the biggest ones is education. It is all this stuff about step up and about increasing the taxes. A lot of that goes back to education and what are we going to do about uh, the problem with teacher pay and all of that kind of stuff. Well, I am certainly not going to be the person who says that teachers don't deserve a pay raise. I know far too many teachers to do that as a pledge. So, uh, I'm not going to come out against a teacher pay raise, but I think that there's really a much bigger issue than pay. That's right. With our classrooms today, we have politicians and bureaucrats at 23rd and Lincoln in Washington, D.C. who control testing, That's right. control curriculum, That's right. control you know, how many <clears throat> kids can be in a classroom, what kind of kids they can be, uh, what can be taught, and it's all political dictates. We have, at the Capitol down there, we have a basically a 149-member state super school board that is trying to control all of these things. 
and our elected school boards, they don't have a lot of authority. They get to decide, you know, what day is Chili Mac Day, and that's, you know, there's not much beyond that. It's all politically controlled by people far away, by people who don't, who aren't in these schools every day, and don't understand what students need and what teachers need to be successful. So that's one of the things that I want to do and I want to talk about as governor and as a candidate for governor is pushing that authority back down to our local schools, to our education professionals who, regardless of, uh, regardless of anything outside the classroom, they are the people who are trained and who have the experience uh, to really teach our students what they need to know, and we're not letting them do that. Now, I'm sure all of, I'm sure most of you have at some point in time been in a work situation where you've been unhappy with your employment, where your boss has been micromanaging. Well, that's what's happening with these teachers. So they're micromanaged. They're they're told everything what to do. They're not allowed to innovate. They're not allowed to really reach their students and are unhappy. What do you do if you're unhappy in your job? You either leave or you say, give me more money. So that's what they're doing, is they're either leaving or they're saying, give me more money. Now, again, I'm not trying to say that improving the workplace and giving our education professionals the authority to run their classroom and reach their students the way that they feel that they need to is going to be a cure-all. But if we don't do that, and we just pay more money, where it's a band-aid on an artery wound. We are not going to solve anything if we don't do that. The people who need to be making decisions about the education of children are teachers and parents who know that child. That's right. Mm -hmm. If you're not in a school every day with that child, or you're not seeing that child every day when they come home from school, what do you know about what they need? But our politicians at 23rd and Lincoln and at Washington, D.C. both think that they know everything about what to tell us, what about how every child should be educated, and it's a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, one of the things that has happened with it is that we have had, I know it was certainly the case when I was in school, and uh, it's, I, I, I know because of my children that has been that way ever since, that the message is just college, college, college. If you don't do college, you're nothing. Well, we have hundreds of thousands of skilled labor jobs in this country, including many here in Oklahoma, that baby boomers are retiring out of every day. It grows more and more and more, and we don't have people to fill those jobs because we have been because of political dictates. We have been telling our young people, college, 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 and we have not been preparing them to fill these skilled labor jobs. And it's harming our economy. <coughs> now, I'm not saying that every teacher would do it, but some of our teachers would innovate and find ways to teach those, those kinds of jobs because they would see that there's a need for that. Well, it's never going to come from the politicians, but it would come from some of our teachers, and when it comes from some of our teachers, the other ones would see it, and they would also be able to innovate if they had the freedom to do so. That would do a lot for us right there. So that's one of the things that I've been talking about a lot is education, and like I said, I think that our education professionals in our local schools are a lot more qualified than anybody at the Capitol building to make those decisions. I've also been talking a lot about criminal justice reform. Uh, now, I work for the police department. I hear the cop side of this every day. Uh, but we have too many people in our prisons. And it is a luxury that we simply cannot afford anymore. So what we have to do is we have to look at that prison population and we have to find the people who shouldn't be in there to begin with and find ways to get them out of that system in a way that is going to try to put them on a pathway to being a productive citizen, not just because it's too expensive, although it is, not just because it's 
a moral failing to put people into a prison system when they shouldn't be there. But because if we don't, and this already happens, we make it impossible to keep people who are really dangerous, who should be locked away from society, in. Really dangerous people get let out of prison early all the time because we have overcrowding. So we make ourselves less safe, we create more crime. We all know that the prison system is the higher education system of the criminal world. So we take people who shouldn't be there, put them in there, and then they come out worse than before and more dangerous to us than before. So we need to look at sentencing reform, and we need to look at uh, the people who are there that should not be there. And I think uh, Joe Alba, the director of the Department of Corrections, is doing everything he can to identify those people, and he's just not getting a lot of support. Uh, despite what Governor Fallon has said over the years about criminal justice reform, I don't see a lot of support from the governor's office to what Director Alba is trying to do. Yep. So I certainly am going to continue to talk about that, and as governor, that would be a top priority to address that, uh, because like I said, we're making ourselves less safe, not more. And the other thing that, uh, the other major issue that I've spent most of my time talking about is, and this gets to the heart of the Step Up program and all of that stuff, is that we have not been prioritizing spending. We have an incentive evaluation commission that reviews all of our incentives and subsidies and various other crony capitalist giveaways. Uh, and the programs that, are, that they review, and by the way, they don't just review that every year. It, there's so much of it. It takes them four years to review all. So, uh, but if you just go through and add up the dollar amounts of all of those programs, it's $450 million. Now, you can't tell me that every single penny of that is essential and we can't live without it. Uh, there's things in there like the subsidy for people who want to come here and make movies. So that's... Uh, you know, that's been tens of millions of dollars that we put into that program for people to come here and make movies, and most of those movies portray Oklahoma in a poor light. So I don't, I, but apparently that's the, the people that are in office now seem to think that that's essential and we can't live without it. Anyway, there's $450 million <laughs> worth of stuff there. Not counting the stuff that does not have a specific dollar amount attached. And we're not talking about reducing or eliminating any of that. So there are certainly, that's one area where we can look at trimming the fat. Uh, we can also look at some of the, some agency consolidation that has, that is being ignored at 23rd and Lincoln. Uh, we have an agricultural department and then we also have a sorghum committee and a peanut commission, and a bull weevil eradication commission. Now that's not to say that some of those entities don't perform some sort of useful function. Uh, my friend Ken Young is, ha, has been uh, the past chair of the cosmetology board, uh, and you know they're a self-funding agency through the fees that are paid to them. So you know some of these entities are going to be things that are not necessarily going to save us money, but others are going to save us money. And why they have to be their own state agency that's going to have their own people to go lobby for whatever they want, instead of being the Department of Agriculture, there's no good answer for that. If wheat's not agriculture, it, what is it? If sorghum's not agriculture, what is it? <coughs> but all of this stuff in one house where we have it in one spot where we can find things to cut instead of bucking up against an individual agency that is going to protect their turf no matter what. It's the same thing with our law enforcement agencies. We have a Department of Public Safety that's over our highway patrol. We also have Bureau of Narcotics, State Bureau of Investigation, the ABLE Commission, and you know those are the three that I can remember off the top of my head. I know there's at least that many more. We can take all of our state law enforcement agencies and put them in 
one house. And that way, when we see a place where an agency has a reduction in what it needs to enforce, like after, I, ex I fully expect state question 788 to pass, and presumably after that passes and medical cannabis is legal, that's going to reduce the amount of things that the Bureau of Narcotics needs to do. Well, when they have less to do, do you think that they're going to give up any part of their budget or any part of their personnel or anything at all? No, they're going to fight tooth and nail for every part of their, uh, of their turf. If they are part of a larger state, in, state enforcement, law enforcement agency, then they don't have to cut staff. They can trans, you know, some of those some of those people can be repurposed into another department, or and things of that nature, which is going to make it easier to reduce what that agency does over time. Because as long as these all of these we've got 231 state agencies, you go to the list and count them. That's the number. If, if every one of those is going to fight for every piece of their turf. And it makes it hard to cut it. So we need to consolidate some of these agencies, not just for the areas where we can reduce the budget just for that agency right now, but going forward so that we can continue to reduce the size of state and impact of state government where it's appropriate to do so. So those are really the things that I've been talking the most about on the campaign trail. I find a lot of people are interested in those things. I find a lot of people don't, are not hearing a lot of those things elsewhere, and it's what most average people think. Uh, it's, there are th some things that are complicated about government. You try to follow the path of a bill, and it is a meandering uh, morass of a path. Your, your compass is not going to work. But some of these other things about saving money and what government should and shouldn't be doing are really not that not that complex and most people get it that a lot of government spending is not not only not benefiting them but it's benefiting somebody who's got friends down there at the capitol so we know this <coughs> instinctively but the two establishment parties they're the ones with all those friends and all those friends are who helps them get back into those offices well i'm not part of that and that's why I can talk about these things, and not just talk about it, but mean it. And so that's why I'm running for governor, because I want to get away from what the two establishment parties have done uh, since statehood, and they've, they've each had their chance now. We've got to get away from that, and we need a new direction for Oklahoma. And that's what I'm about. Awesome. You want to open it up for questions? I'm Chris. Uh, let's go back to your first point, education. By bringing it up first, I assume that it's a prominent part of what you want to do. Now, our Constitution has a clause in it that says the state shall provide for a common education. Mm -hmm. Would you want to go so far as to maybe not have that clause in there and truly return public education to the school district as a governing agency and make each district truly autonomous. I don't know how politically feasible that would be. Mm -hmm. That would be a tall order, but I would be happy to move in that direction. I think, I don't know how state government should be, I don't know how that you can make informed decisions about how children should be educated from the capital building. I just don't know how that works. Okay. Uh, I certainly do intend to push for moving uh, our tax system towards more reliance on local sources instead of state government. And there's, there's some small things that can be done and there's some big things that can be attempted. So uh, I would definitely move in that direction. Yes, sir. I'm right on top of the pile with you when it comes to prisons in Oklahoma. Uh, we're number two in the nation for incarcerating per capita. Mm -hmm. We are number one for incarcerating women. And that's not just in the nation, but that's globally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's terrible. 
uh, uh, the public defenders have such a workload that they can't devote time to an individual case. In fact, I find that most of the time the, uh, the person being prosecuted can never reach them. Even the relatives can't reach them by phone or any other way. They don't answer the phone. Uh, they're just too busy. They uh, will get a plea bargain offer from prosecuting attorneys. Say, okay, you got to sign this because this is the best you're going to get. And, the, and they do. I know one woman that's incarcerated right now. She signed a plea bargain for 15 years. Never should have happened. Uh, I also know that um, another thing is, is these, these prosecuting attorneys, it, Oklahoma's accessory laws is a big part of the problem with women being incarcerated mm -hmm. because if he did it, she had to know about it, and she's an accessory, and they're both going to prison. She may not have known anything, and it doesn't matter. Well, and, we, and we had the, the case just the other day that made the news about the woman who uh, got several years for knowing about it when the guy just got probation. I, I may be remembering the details. That happens, also, too. Yeah. And uh, I do know that they, uh, uh, a lot of times, the, uh, uh, I can't remember what I was going to say, but, um, yeah, the, it is an absolute mess. And, so, and, and there are so many people right now that are incarcerated that should not be. I know where I was going. Because they can't, they can't afford an attorney when they get in there. They don't sit around and have a savings for legal defense just in case somebody comes in and says hey you did this we're taking you in and uh, and and a quick trial forget that that's not going to happen I know one person has been in over a year and she's not going to see a trial until April so, so what's the what's the question uh, well, that's not really a question of what I was just saying. Uh, I am on top of the pile, and I just wanted to expound on the problem. Sure, sure. And it, uh, I'll go ahead and say to that, and uh, I see both of you. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the problem with that is with our district attorneys. Exactly. And, you know, and, and it's hard to blame them, because what does a district attorney get, get elected on? Putting people in jail. So we need to have, um, and that's another part, reason why I'm running is to build the Libertarian Party into a permanent fixture on in the political landscape, so that we can get some Libertarian candidates who want to balance that out a little bit. So um, let's see. I don't know who was first. That's okay. Go ahead. Thirty years ago, there were only seven crimes that had a seventy-five percent sentence. And now it's just expanded. So I think one of the solutions is to go back to those seven crimes that require 75% inflation of the sentence. Well, the sentencing reform is, it, it will be key. Uh, I, I mentioned that I'm a genealogist. I've come across some of, uh, some of my relatives in the past not all of them, you know, most of them <laughs> stay up there. But there's a few people who, who got in trouble from time to time. And a murder charge, uh, a murder conviction. I have uh, a third great uncle who went to prison for murder in 1894, and he got 10 years. And he was let out on the three quarters law after after serving three quarters of that sentence. Uh, so we have let our desire for vengeance cause us to want to lock everybody up for as long as we possibly can. Uh, and I, I think uh, we're meeting in a church. I think I can remind everyone that uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's not our job to seek revenge. Our job is to keep the public safe. And what we're doing now doesn't. The framers of the Constitution felt like it would be better to let 10 guilty people go free than to convict one innocent person. Mm -hmm. I, I, one of the biggest sinkholes in uh, public education is the college system. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, by Constitution in the state of Oklahoma, the government is not allowed to audit them. 
we're not allowed to challenge how they spend their money. So do you have any ideas how you could rein in or cut back the, the, the billions of dollars that are going into higher ed? Uh, I agree with you. It's gonna, that's an uphill slope right there. I don't have a problem with talking about the fact that they never seem. You know, I'm a football fan, college football fan. I, you know, I love the Sooners, but every time I go down by that campus, they're building something new. They never stop building new buildings. Uh, I, I don't know that we really need constant construction of massive facilities at a constant pace. So, I, you know, I certainly agree, see the, that the money is going into higher education, particularly those two flagship uh, institutions, uh, and it's sort of a massive sinkhole of funds. Uh, it, again, it's going to be really hard to take on that fight because, you know, you go down into the Capitol building and you've got a bunch of OU and OSU grads who are voting on everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's certainly something that um, you can... We can try to chip away at it as best we can, but it's 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 not going to be easy to take that off. Can, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Would you consider pledging not to appoint a former politician to replace David Warren when he retires? I hey, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I think he's a good question. <laughs> I would I would agree with that. I would be happy to, to say that uh, I would rule out anybody who's. Uh, had a career in state government or been an elected official. Uh, I don't know who that. Um, or I, I don't know who that would be. Believe that would that would be acceptable, but uh, we try to find that person. How about an educator. Those are just bad. Yeah. Um, this week we saw where at UCO we received public some of our money mm -hmm. um, has decided to not allow Kevin Ham. To speak on campus, mm -hmm. but yet they'll have gay pride and they'll have mm -hmm. all kinds of different other things going on in the campus. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to take a hard look at the state constitution and what can be done to, if even if we can't, if well, you can we can put some requirements on the re, on on them being able to receive government funding or federal or state funding. So what you're trying to say is you want to ensure free speech on the campus. I do. Yeah. And that's for and that's for that's for all sides. I mean, but I, you know, if I'm going to to fight to allow somebody else to have the right, then they need to you know when when push comes to shove, it's our turn as well. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah. I, I understand your point, and I understand that there's a free, free speech issue, uh, but I would be reluctant to dictate to a college who they would. They get our money. I, <laughs> well, they get our, they get our, I, that's I, our tax dollars. I, under, I, I understand. <coughs> I would be more interested in reducing the budget expenditure. There you go. Um, and, oh, I'm and, not and not in a punitive, <laughs> not in a punitive fashion. You know, not you didn't let this person speak, and so now I want to cut your appropriation. But oh, just trying to get why the not? state, reduce the state role in that yeah, as much as we can, it. regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's like there's there's a number of issues I think that we can take with our with college campuses that that we may not individually like. Uh, but if I'm going to stand up here and say that I think our educators in our public schools should be given autonomy, I don't know that I can turn around and say that our educators, much as I may not like their decisions, uh, that, uh, that I don't think that they should have autonomy in our, in our universities. Autonomy so, within or outside of the Constitution? Yeah, but what about the Constitution? Our well, I, I, I understand yeah. that. Say, what about the Constitution? Which <laughs> one? <laughs> I don't. I mean, are there any exempted from this free speech? And you have to argue to these people that they are violating the Constitution. What are they preventing that person from speaking at all, or are they just preventing that person from speaking on campus? 
It doesn't matter. It does matter. If he had been invited and then he could have been invited, it does not matter. I Basically, you have organi school organizations that are funded in part by fees, school fees. Mm -hmm. They're legitimate chartered organizations. They invite a speaker, and the administration is not allowed to Okay, to so if... Does that mean that any organization that wants to speak on campus should be allowed to do no, so? No, it's a chartered, organi can chartered campus organization mm -hmm. funded by school fees, mm -hmm. approved by the administration, mm -hmm. invites a controversial speaker. Mm -hmm. So it's a student organization. It's not some random community organization. Mm -hmm. It's a student organization that, you know, in other words, that you can have and. Um, they should be able to, you know, to invite whoever they want and have them speak. I mean, the Democrat people can do it, the Republican people, um, whatever groups are there, um, need to be able to, you know, if they're a chartered organization funded with school fees that are paid by students and taxpayers, um, the school should not be picking, you know, basically not allowing people to come speak just because they don't agree with their views. And that's happening all over the country. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that that, uh, that it has happened in a lot of places, and I understand that it happened that this has happened at UCO, and I'm not saying that I approve of it, but I don't know that it is. Um, I don't know that trying to punish a university for doing that is. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree that just because that. We should overrule how the universities are run, and in part because, in my view, every time we can defer to the lower level of authority, we're going to be, we're going to tend to be better off. It's not going to be perfect. Nothing's perfect. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the criticisms that are always labeled leveled at us libertarians is that we're idealistic. That we, you know, we think everything is going to, you know, the free market will cure everything. Well, no, it's going to be messy. It's going to be problematic. We're going to have things where people disagree and, and problems that we can't solve. Uh, this is, you know, this is going to be one of them where, where I think, you know, people can disagree honestly about what the school should do. Um, and, well, you know, if, if you do that, this, then what if a uh, school, a properly chartered school organization decides that they want to invite somebody from Al-Qaeda to come speak. They should be able to do it. It's up to the students to decide whether they're going to attend or not, too. Uh -huh. Well, that's certain. If they're right, that's true. I'm not going, they only end up with a hundred. Now, what I, will say, what I will say is that if, a, if, if, if someone is going to speak and there are going to be people who try to shut that down, I, I, like we have seen some of the groups do, mm -hmm. Uh, I would think that uh, providing resources, if that university needs it, in order to ensure order, would certainly be something that would be a proper, proper right. function of state government or and local, uh, local government to do that. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think we're going to have uh, an agree to disagree moment and on this. And that's okay. That's, no, that's fine. You know, and that's, that's what this is about, getting to yeah. know you and where right. you stand and, and how do sure. things work. Let's take one more question, and then we need to move on to, um, I think, I think to Gary. Someone over here has been waiting for Who's been waiting? There. David had one. David. David, did you have one? Larry, do you want to ask? Yeah, back on education, and you mentioned mm -hmm. testing. Uh, do you think the state of Oklahoma should... Uh, administer the same test for every public school student in the state you know, at grade level, you get grade level. I don't think a one size solution, one size fits all solution is good for every student. Uh, there's a there's a cartoon that I think uh, that I saw once that really illustrates this point. It's a bunch of students in a row, they're all sitting at their desks and they all have a thought bubble above their head. And the first one, you know, has a round bubble. The second one has a cloud-shaped bubble, and then the two behind that, well, the one at the very back has a square-shaped bubble, and the third one, the teacher is there cutting the bubble into a square shape. 
Right. I think when you have these one-size-fits-all solutions to say every student must do this this way at this time, you uh, I don't think that's any way to, to run a school. I think our, our pro education professionals need to be trusted to run their classroom. If we don't trust them to run their classroom and do what's best for their students, why are they in there at all? Now, that's not to say that we can't have improvement in our educators, but it's not going to come from the top down. It's going to come from the bottom up. And, you know, everybody always wants to talk about we need parents to get involved. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to go talk to the teacher. What are they going to find out from the teacher? That the teacher can't do anything because they have to adhere to all these rules that are handed down to them. So if you want parent involvement, you've got to give them somebody that they can talk to that's got some power. And that's, uh, right now it's not the teacher, it's somebody at the Capitol that they, that, that parent doesn't even know they need to talk to. So, no, I really don't think uh, standardized testing is, I'm not, I'm not a fan at all. All right, do you want to make a closing statement real quick and then I'll bring Gary up here? Um, <clears throat> Chris Powell, Libertarian for Governor, if you... Uh, want to vote in the Libertarian primary on June 26th. If you're not a registered Libertarian, you need to change your registration by March 31st. And y'all aren't letting independents vote this time, is that correct? No, I, I did not agree with that, but, but the primary is closed, so you do have to be a okay, registered well, I, Libertarian. Okay. Uh, I've got a website, powellforgovernor.com. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. And I'm not just running for me. I'm not really running for me at all. I mean, everybody who runs for office is a little bit of a narcissist, but it's not about me. It's about building a party that will be a permanent fixture and will bring a new voice that is not being heard to the Oklahoma political scene, a new direction for Oklahoma. So awesome. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. The first time I met you, I thought you were was when he was our state GOP chair. And so I'm going to start with it from that point in time because I didn't know him before, so we're just going to go from this point on. So Gary was elected Oklahoma Republican Party chairman in 2003 and is, is distinguished as the longest serving chairman and executive director in the history of the state party. He resigned his position in 2010 to make a third attempt at being elected state auditor and inspector. He was reelected in 2014. And when, with Gary leading the auditor's office, they have increased the quantity of audits it conducts without sacrificing the quality of work product and have doubled the number of CPAs on staff. Gary and his wife, the former Mary Jane Horton, have been married 40 years and live on their farm southwest of is that Cash? Cash. Cash, where they raised two children and built their cow calf operation of over 30 years. After a 36-year teaching career, Mary Jane retired in May 2011. After 36 years, she needed to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Their daughter, Kelly Gilliland, is a pre-K teacher at Chattanooga Elementary School. Their son, Chris, manages the family farm and is a former member of the United States Marine Corps. The Joneses have three wonderful grandchildren. If you're not, if you don't follow him on Facebook, I'd recommend that you do. You get to see his new calves, and you get to see his grandkids, and it's a lot of fun. So please join me in welcoming our state auditor and re Republican candidate for governor, Gary Jones. Excuse me if I cough a little bit tonight. <coughs> Those of you who've been involved in Republican politics know me, you know, in those terms. Uh, what you don't know is the kid that was 14 years old that went to work cooking in a Mexican restaurant, and by 15 I was the head cook in that restaurant. At 18 I went to work for Bell Telephone when I started college as a telephone operator. By 20 I was a manager over 120 operators. By 21 I was promoted on state staff doing independent cost studies, traveling around the state doing audits and figuring up costs for independent companies. I did that for 10 years, quit and started a uh, company with myself and a high school kid, built it up to 40 employees, did over $10 million worth of business, and had that for 16 years. I did that before I ever got involved in politics. You know, my degree is in business administration, I have concentration in accounting, I'm a certified public accountant, I'm also a certified fraud examiner. 
And uh, I got involved in politics back in 1994. You know, whenever the Tea Party movement came came about, and everybody got riled up and said, we've got to get in there and do something. That happened for me in 1994. Uh, <coughs> I made decisions to run for county commissioner. Didn't take a single penny in campaign contributions. I went out and knocked on doors. Thank you. And uh, beat a 10-year incumbent that outspent me five to one. It's, it's funny because on election night, uh, his son-in-law and I went to college together, high school and college together. I was at the courthouse on election day, and he wished me luck. He turned to a mutual friend and said he won't get 20% of the vote. He's right, I got 53%. <laughs> well, what's funny, though, is that back then we had call waiting. And they asked me, so where's your watch party going to be? I said, my watch party's going to be at home. My feet are tired, I'm sore, I'm going to be with my family. So I started listening to it on the radio, and then they had it nip and tuck all night long, and then the TV station actually announced that my opponent had won. So I told my wife, do I call him and congratulate him? He said, no, wait. Finally, someone called me from the election board and said, here you won. Then my phone started ringing. Every time I, picked, I answered a call, another call came in. And I started tallying those. By the, and people said, well, you know, now that you now that this election's over, would you be willing to take a campaign contribution? I was for you all along, even though I knew they contributed to my phone. <laughs> and so the last call came in at a quarter to midnight. And I had 257 calls. And I turned to my wife and said, I've got the same friends tonight that I had this morning. But it's amazing because the first meeting I went to, the, uh, the gentleman that was the mayor of Cash, who happened to be the John Deere rep, came and said, hey, you want to go to lunch? And I said, sure. So we go to lunch and I get ready to pay, you know, that's where it's ticking. The lady says, no, it's already been taken care of. So I said, Jimmy, you don't need to do that. He said, no, I've got an expense account. So the next Monday I called him and said, hey, you want to go to lunch? He said, yeah. I said, well, so what happens, he goes to wash his hands. I give the lady a $20 bill and said, this is for lunch. When he comes to that, he asked for the ticket. They said, it's already been paid for. He said, you don't need to do that. I said, no, Jimmy, we'll go Dutch or we'll, we won't go at all. I never took as much as, as a cup of coffee. <coughs> what I did, though, is the, first, the, the second meeting, they brought me a bridge inspection report and said that there are 72 bridges in my district that were substandard. I put together a plan to replace the 10 worst bridges. Someone said, you can't do that because only a commissioner would only do somewhere between four and six in the four-year term. By the end of that four years, I had not only done those 10, but I did 24 more. We did 34, all steel and concrete, the most in the history of the state. And we did that because I looked at better ideas of how to do things better and more cost effective. And I will tell you, a defining moment of whether or not I was an honest politician came to me <coughs> whenever Wackenhut Prison, <coughs> now called GEO, wanted to put a private prison in rural Comanche County. And they didn't, the city council that were pushing this deal didn't know that if it was outside the city limits, the county commissioner had to make a decision as to whether or not they approved it. And the commissioner that the district was in didn't want it. The other commissioner, he's going to do whatever the Chamber of Commerce tells him to do. And I'm, I, I do what I always do. I research it to look to see if this is the best deal for the county. Thank you. Best deal for the county. And I come to the conclusion, this is not the best location because we're going to have to build water, sewer, police protection, uh, provides police protection, fire protection, and the county can't do that. So the smart thing to do is, I started looking at this and I thought, well, if, this, if they really want it there, the best thing to do would be for the city of Lawton to annex it, and then that way they'll have to pay taxes on the material they bring in, they'll pay for the infrastructure. So the reason I brought that up is that a lady from the Chamber of here we are, we got a, a lady from the Chamber of Commerce calls me and says, Gary, we really need you to go yes on this issue. I said, Pat, let me tell you what we really need to do. We've got a meeting at 2 o'clock, and one commissioner is voting yes, one's voting no. I'm going to go ahead and vote no, because at 4 o'clock, the city of Lawton's going to vote to annex it, which means they'll still get it, and they're going to get $5 million worth of money to pay for the infrastructure. <coughs> she said, well, let me tell you what we're willing to do. We're willing to pay for your entire re-election up to $30,000 if you vote yes. <laughs> I said, Pat, I can't do that. She said, well, it's legal. I said, I don't care if it's legal, it's not right. So when I voted no, they not only spent $30,000 to get me beat, they spent $48,000. Keep in mind, the most had ever been spent in the county commissioner wage was $15,000. Now granted, it wasn't, uh, it didn't help the fact that I had worked for four years to come up with a plan to build a new county jail 
because our county jail was rated for 97 people, and we consistently had 230 people in that jail. We were stacking them three high. So I came up with a plan to do a quarter cent sales tax for 10 years to pay for the jail, and they were met, city of council and the uh, chamber of commerce was mad at me because they wanted to put it on the property taxes. I said, it's not the property tax uh, owners that are causing this. So it passed 5149, I lost 5149. But what that did is, I don't give up. As you mentioned earlier, I made my third run for auditor. So what I did is I started looking to see what I could continue to do. So at that time, I went back to see how many hours I liked for I could sit for my CPA exam. I was one class short after 21 years. I, I took that class, took a review class, the three hardest tests I've ever taken in my life, or four hardest tests. I think I bruised my brain taking it. So what I said was, if I pass that, I'm going to run for state auditor. Because I said, what well, we need to have good government in Oklahoma, we need a good attorney general that will stand up for the people. We didn't have that Drew Edmondson. We need a good state auditor. And I wasn't going to go to law school. So I, I ran three different times. Now, granted, I didn't win the first time. I got 49%. <laughs> but what we uncovered later was the fact that half of my opponent's money was illegal, coming from a gentleman by the name of Gene Stipe and his partners. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Gene Stipe? <laughs> well, what I did is I put the pieces of the puzzle together as a private citizen that ultimately went and, and went to the FBI with it, ultimately resulted in eight indictments, seven convictions. We sent Gene Stipe to prison. Now, granted, it was a prison hospital. He has pro revoked, but he went to a prison hospital to be evaluated. They closed the doors behind him based on the information I fed to the FBI. In fact, the second time I talked to the FBI, they said, Mr. Jones, for 30 years we've been trying to catch these guys. You gave us a roadmap directed to them. Yeah. You know, I, I uh, ran for auditor in 2010, was out spent 850000 to 150000 but went around talking about what I wanted to do. I talked, I've been talking about performance audits since 2002. I'm the one person that actually knows what a performance audit is where you go in and start looking at not just whether or not the money is spent legally, but is it spent cost effectively and efficiently. And we tried to get a bill passed my first year in office that would allow the state auditor's office to have the resources and the, the authority to do a performance audit on every major agency on a rotating basis once every four years, including universities. The, the state auditor's office can audit the universities if they're asked. The last time they received a re request back in the 80s. Three different universities were asked to be audited. First two that were audited, the, pre the presidents went to prison. The next one, the bookstore owner went to prison. Instead of continuing, the legislature who made the request said, we think you've done enough. There's no more, no more need. And so that, that's why they haven't been done. <coughs> you know, everybody talks about we need an outsider. You know, I have always been a reformer. We don't need an outsider. What we need is somebody that understands what needs to be done and has the intestinal fortitude to do it, and I have. You know, I've, I've, to the point where the legislature wants to kick me out of the Capitol, they've cut my appropriations. You know, they even moved my parking space. <laughs> you know, because we've done the right thing. And, and I will tell you that, you know, back in 2007, the auditor's office was, was funded, uh, appropriated $5.8 million. We're now to $2.9 million. There's 154 employees then, there's 108 now. We're doing more audits now than we did then. But what we have done is that, and this is a huge problem. We talk about the problem with the universities. The universities are controlled by board members. And boards and commissions are, are where the real power with the governor comes. The number one reason somebody gets appointed to a board, because they made a major contribution to the politician, usually the governor. <coughs> you know, when, when I, uh, I have never had a political hire since I've been in office. When I came in, in office, we went through and, and, and went to every employee and said, okay, you've got a job, it's up to you to keep it. We had about 10 people we had to let go in the first year because they weren't performing their job. Every person we've hired has an accounting degree or at least 10 years experience in, a, in accounting. So we have, we have true professionals. But I will tell you that the, the process by which we go through as a budget right now is it, it, so flawed, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's no, no type of accounting or budgeting I've ever seen in my life. We have a process right now where we have the House does a budget, the Senate does a budget, the Governor does a budget, and then they all get behind closed doors in the last two weeks of session, and a handful of people work it out, and all of a sudden a white puff of smoke comes out, and they announce we have a budget. <laughs> and it's either up or down. 
That's there's exactly no discussion. Good. There's no debate. That's, That's right. absolutely I said, right. you know, and, and here's what's amazing to me. You, you talk about the incentive commission. You know why we have a separate incentive commission? They had the Pew Center come in, and the Pew Center came to us and said, well, well what do you think your role ought to be in these, these, uh, these uh, evaluating these incentives? I said, well, David Dank's com uh, interim study was probably the best interim study that's been done in the last 20 years in, in the state of Oklahoma. What he recommended was the state auditor's office review the incentives to make sure they're meeting the minimum requirements each year, and that once every four years you're reviewing the program to determine whether or not you're getting a fair return on the investment. The Pew Center came in, they looked at that, and they asked us, and I told them, I said, that's exactly what you should be doing. However, they stacked the committee with people from the Chamber of Commerce who came back and said, we need to have an independent incentive commission that's appointed by the bureaucrats, by the politicians, and then they hire an outside uh, consultant for $250,000 on a four-year contract. The consultant's made up of former state auditors and former finance people from other states. But the definition of an expert is? got 50 miles away from home with a briefcase. Yeah. Yeah. If you're from out of state, you're a real expert. But we, they came to us and said, why are you not doing this? And ultimately, the, the reason that the Speaker of the House gave was that the business community does not want the state auditor looking at their books. I said, real simple, tell them to quit asking for state money, we won't look at their That's books. Right. But they've taken that away from us. Now they've taken the accountability. We had a bill that, that would create a joint committee on accountability made up of House and Senate members and people from the auditor's office, the same people that you elect to oversee the money, that would meet at least once every 90 days to determine what agencies to be looked at in what order. Every single representative or senator could go and make a request to that commi committee to ask to have an audit be done. They would review it and, and act on that. Right now, used to, before 2004, the Speaker of the House or the Pro Tem of the Senate Either one could ask for an audit, either an investigative audit or a performance audit. When the Democrats saw the Republicans were getting ready to take over, they changed it to speaker and pro tem. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many requests have come since that's changed? Zero. Not one from the legislature. So now we've got this step up Oklahoma group that comes in and said, oh, we need to set up another office, uh, like we don't have enough of them, <laughs> another office that provides for budget and accountability. Guys, those are conflicting functions, which is a huge problem. We have, you need an office of accounting and budgets. You don't need three different offices, you need one of, of staff, you know, staff and professionals that, that really provide the information to the House, the Senate, and the Governor to be able to make budget decisions. You know, right now, how many of you have heard about the problems of the State Health Department? <laughs> well, I may have not heard about the problem of the state. <laughs> and yes, our office found that. But let me tell you what the problem there was. It is an accounting problem and it is a management problem. An accounting problem because when we walked in there within 24 hours, we went in and ran the reports called combining, uh, combining trial balances, where you should run those every single year. Every agency should, put, should run those and, and create a financial statement. We went back and ran them from 2011 to 2017. And, and they, they, they had to tape it together because there's so many different uh, funds that come into that. It was actually four foot by four foot by the time you got through. And our people, we would go, my God, there it is right there. And they're going, what are you looking at? It's, it's kind of like taking those pictures and holding them, getting them in focus. Mm -hmm. They don't get them in focus. But as accountants, in fact, I get accused of talking numbers all the time. I'm real good with numbers. It's the words that get me. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, what we saw was that from 2011 to 2017, their payroll went from $130 million up to $163 million. Their con contract of services went from $30 million up to $58 million. And then you go down and look at the bottom, you look at the amount of revenue that came in, the amount of expenses, and you can see that in 11, that they brought more money in than they spent. 12, they brought more money than they spent. 13, they overspent by $1.3 million. Now keep in mind, if you have reserve funds or or, or that, and to cover that, that's okay. But in 2014, they overspent by 4.5, and then what happened, someone sent an anonymous complaint to the FBI and to the Attorney General's office and said there's some things going on that you, you ought to know about. The FBI sends it to the AG because it's a state problem. The AG sends it right back to the Health Department. They do an internal investigation and nobody knows what's going on. They don't make any changes. Wow. The next year, they overspend by 7.6 million dollars, then they lose their chief financial officer, and they overspend by $16 million. There's your $30 million, guys. 
And here's the thing. They did not overspend their budget. And here's what, here, here's what these guys are looking at. They're looking at how much money is budgeted. And they said, okay, what they spent was within that budget. Well, what they're not looking at is how much money came in as far as revenue based on the projected revenue. Mm -hmm. So while they didn't overspend their budget, they overspent their revenue. A good example is if, if, um, if, if your take-home pay was $5,000 a month and your budget $4,700 a month, and all of a sudden you take a pay cut, but you don't adjust your budget. That should have been caught by people doing the budgeting. It should have been caught by the House. It should have been caught by the Senate. It should have been caught by Office of Management Enterprise Services. It should have been caught by the board. But nobody was doing the proper accounting. Now, the records that they do go into a financial statement prepared by OMES. So they throw all that in one lump sum. And so ultimately, we found it. Now I can tell you what happened, when it happened. Now the question is, when did somebody start authorizing them to spend money out of restricted funds? And who authorized that? That's what we're looking at now. About ready to open it up for questions? <coughs> no. Okay, I'm going to ask the first question. Sure. Why are you running for governor? Well, uh, for years, I've, I've seen what's going on with the Capitol. And I've said that, I used to jokingly say, when I'm in charge, we're going to do it different. Literally joking about it. And I literally prayed that somebody would step in here that understands what's going on, understands the budget situation, and has a plan to fix it and has the intestinal fortitude to stand up and do it. And I do. Because what we're talking about now affects the future of our kids and grandkids. You know, I, I, the idea that somebody could walk in and that there was somebody at a candidate forum in, in Ardmore that heard us speak. There was four different candidates there and they said, it'd take a year and a half for any other candidate to get to the point where they understand what's going on in the state of Oklahoma as, as much as Gary Jones knows. And because of that, I, I, you know, I don't have the desire to be governor. And, and of course, politics is a, is a funny game. I, I remember something J.C. Watts said at a town hall meeting in April of 1995. He said when he got out of professional sports, he never dreamed he'd get in a profession that people had bigger egos. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, that is a huge, huge problem. I mean, there are people that, that have said that God told them that they'll be governor someday. And, I, and I'm going, you know what? God didn't tell me that. What God did tell me was that it's my decision and that if I don't pursue this, then, then I'm going to regret it the rest of my life. And because of that, now I don't have the millionaires and be, I can't write a million dollar check. Honest politicians don't get a lot of money. People that don't pander to special interests don't get a lot of money. So what I'm relying on is the fact that the same thing I relied on when I ran for office the first time. While Harold Ham's ex-wife wrote a $200,000 check for the benefit of one candidate. On election day, she counts one. And I'm relying on the fact that there's enough people that care about this state enough that they're willing to show up, and there'll be more ones on my column than there will be the others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? On top of you running for governor right, right. now, right. you've got this scandal with the health department. And the, the back and forth between you and Dorfman are on the timeline. And, and then now you've got this. Uh, and if you notice, the information that comes out proves my timeline. Yes, it, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. I would agree with you there. And, and the, the openness, the transparency that you're trying to bring. I, I salute it. But you also have this lawsuit <laughs> that you're named as a defendant, along with uh, the former attorney, Jed, while well, the current, but we know with Scott Pruitt, who's being challenged sure. there. Right. Have you got anything more to add or what we're to expect to ha see happen out of this? This is the well, Tar Creek. And, and, and you either believe in transparency or you don't. Yeah. You either believe in the open records and open meetings or you don't, and I do. And, the, for instance, when I first came into office, there were just a room about this big just full of file cabinets. Mm -hmm. I thought, what in the world? And they said, well, any entity like a school or a city or trust authority files an audit has to be filed with us, and we have to keep five years worth of it. They were in a file cabinet in the basement. I said, you're kidding, in this day and age? So we wrote, in fact, uh, we wrote a law and got it passed. Passed the House and then every committee and everything. We thought that lawmaking was great. We got one passed since, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, what we said was, instead of sending us a bound hard copy, they send it to an electronic. Now you can go to our website, and you can, used to have to pay to get a, a copy made. 
Now you can read it, you can download it, that's transparency. In fact, Oklahoma went from a D to a B on transparency nationwide, and they said the shining, the shining uh, spot in Oklahoma is the state auditor's office. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we, you know, citizens paid for that audit, they have a right to see what's in that audit. And there was a comment made that we did shoddy work. Mm -hmm. Well, prove to the citizens we did shoddy work by asking that the audit be released. Because I would tell you, our people worked extremely hard on that and did a great job. Okay, so what do we expect in timeline? Because the, the, the Tar Creek, that's what I'm talking about, that was sealed by the then Attorney General. And let me tell you how this all came about. Okay. And this is what's even more aggravating. We are the State Auditor and the Inspector General. Mm -hmm. You would think the Inspector General would have a right to go look at something when it's reported. We don't. They put it in statutes that we can't do that. We have to be asked. Senator Coburn's people came and brought two big boxes of information provided by citizens up there that wanted this looked at. We said, Senator, we, we really would like to do this. However, we have to get permission from the, from the uh, governor or the attorney general in order to do this. So they said, okay, we'll take it to the attorney general. The attorney general wrote a letter, sent it back to us within a week. That was their only input on this. So it's our work, our work product. The, if they're not going to file charges, open it up. And one of their arguments is that because they gave it to the lawyer for the people we were auditing, who shared it with the board members that we were auditing, which is, we believe is highly irregular. Uh, so in effect, we think it's been released. We just found that out once this lawsuit was found, was filed. So that being said, we're hoping the judge rules it can be, it'll be out there. Okay. And I, and <coughs> You can't have different levels of the law depending on which people are involved. Everybody should be treated equal. That's right. Okay. Yes, sir. Would you talk about the effort that you um, initiated to get state agencies to reveal all of their revenue sources to the legislature when they come asking for appropriations? And yeah. We, what did you do and what happened? <coughs> yeah, I, I uh, actually wrote an op-ed that went to about 50 different newspapers and it got picked up nationally. And what it said was is that we need to go to needs-based budgeting, mm -hmm. which is a modified version of zero-based budgeting that I've come up with that basically says you look at all sources of revenue and, and lay all that out. And then you also, <coughs> you do a performance audit once every four years to determine whether or not what they're doing is needed. Because what we do now is what's called historic budgeting. You know, your, your budget's based on what you had last year. If you have waste, inefficiencies, and fraud, you, if you have more money, they'll give you 3% more. If you have less money, they'll give you 3% less. That's not a way to do a budget. You know, we, uh, so uh, Washington Times actually wrote an article on this, and it says, uh, Fed should follow Oklahoma's lead on budget. And it goes through and talks about this program. And this is a great way to reduce uh, waste and inefficiencies in government because you're doing it based on what's needed to operate the agency. And the last line said, Washington, or said uh, Washington, are you listening? The problem is we're not doing it in Oklahoma. And we've laid all this out and showed how this can be done. Of course, part of the problem is... Well, I mean, you got it through the House and the Senate and then the governor beat Oh, yeah, no, the, 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 uh, what happened on that one was we created the Joint Committee on Accountability. And we had four different bills that have gone through. One senator held up three different bills and would not let it be heard. Passed the House overwhelmingly. Would not let it be heard. Senator Clark Jolly. <laughs> And he's the same one that that authored the bill to put performance teams under OMES, which basically says the people doing the accounting are now going to be judging, be overseeing it. Well, you don't do the take the test and get grade your own test, and it is proven to be an utter failure. But they put more money in these performance teams than what we wanted to do for for our performance audits. So what happens finally? The Joint Committee on Accountability passes, and. Senator Jolly let it be heard on the Senate, and it passed 44 to nothing in the Senate. However, he informed the senator that was the author of the bill, said, I'm going to let it be heard, but by the way, I talked to Denise North, the governor's chief of staff, and the governor's going to veto it. So they vetoed the bill. Now, that bill has gotten passed again. It passed the House. There was three different accountability bills last year. It passed the House overwhelmingly because it has a bipartisan commission, a committee that would, would uh, really put in place the oversight. So instead of doing this office of accounting or uh, budgets and accountability, all they need to do is pass it in the Senate and the governor can sign it, and that, that oversight will be in place. So. 
Yes. Gary, when you first became state party chair, what was the makeup of the legislature and what was it when you left? I think the makeup of the legislature was like 48 Republicans and 53 Democrats. Uh, the Senate was, I think it was 22, uh, 22 Republicans. Uh, when I left, we had super majorities in both of them. You know, I, and, and here's the thing. I never dreamed of being chairman of the Republican Party. What happened in 2002 was that, yes, we had cockfighting on the ballot. We had you know, people talking about school consolidation. But that wasn't the real issue why Republicans lost. They lost because Democrats out-organized us, outperformed us. They turned out in 8% bigger numbers across the state because they were organized and had to get out the vote. I hate to say this, but the, the state Republican Party became the Tom Cole for Congress Party. All the efforts in Oklahoma went about getting Tom Cole elected to Congress. That was a tough race. But who did we beat up for that? Do what? Who did we beat up for that? Tom Cole in Congress? Well, no, it's, 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 uh, here, here, here's the thing. What happened then was the party was controlled by the consultants. They would go out and raise all the money. They'd give it to the consultants. And the consultants would go where they could make the most money. And in fact, afterwards, they'd go have drinks with the Democrats and laugh and joke about how much money they made. And, and uh, when I came in, I came in as chairman of the Republican Party because I was, I said, this is ridiculous. I said, anybody can do better than this. In fact, the first six months I was there, they tried to starve me out. I mean, they started funneling the money elsewhere, did everything they could. I think they'd done that to somebody else before. But I said, you know what? So, so, so finally, uh, and finally what I said was, if they don't know where I'm getting it, they can't cut me off. So I started going out there and getting money from other sources. And then we started putting the plan together. And we started going out and recruiting good candidates in rural Oklahoma and all over and said, if, and someone said, are you going to go recruit somebody for every office? I said, no. We're going to go out and find the best candidates in those districts. If we have the best candidates, we deserve to win. But we're not going to dilute everything by having a candidate for every office and recruiting people that we couldn't even support. So what we did is we started making those gains and those wins and going around to rural Oklahoma talking about the fact that, that the people in rural Oklahoma are just as conservative as the Republicans in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And we convinced them to switch and get on board and, and built those you know, super majorities. Uh, in 2008, we put together the best program in the history of the state as far as raising money. What we did is we went out and sold our plan, myself working with Matt Pinnell. We said, what we're going to do is we're going to go tell people, here's what we're going to do. We want to hold us accountable. We raised a million dollars, put it aside for the elections with the help of Senator Coburn. And we had the best results ever in the history. And then what was great is in 2010, instead of scrapping everything like most new new chairman came in, Matt picked up on our ideas and built on it, and that's where we, we, we were able to win more. Yes? Let, let's talk about the state budget a little bit. Yes. The total state budget, local money and federal money, is $22.7 billion. It's a little over $25 billion. Okay. And the state of Oklahoma has approximately <coughs> 3 million people. 3. 3.7, 3.8, isn't it? Is it, is it it's close to $4 million. Okay, let's say, say it's $4 million. Okay. That's a lot of money spent per person. Okay, let me, let, me, let me tell you, have you seen the chart that says that in 2000 that the appropriated funds were $5 billion, and in 2017 they're, they're uh, 6.8? Okay, they're talking about the, the, the increase of, of $1.8 billion. It's not really $1.8. And the reason is it's not $6.8 billion dollars appropriated in 17, it's 6.3. The reason is they've taken money that's already been appropriated and they've reappropriated re and give people permission to spend. You can't spend the same dollars twice. Because if, if I could, I could solve every financial problem in the state of Oklahoma. <laughs> so, so here, the number is really 6.3. Uh, so, so the difference is 1.3 billion. Five agencies that represent health care and social services have gone up 1.2 billion. Common Ed has gone up 660 million, which is actually 1.5 percent compounded annually over that period of time, which is inflation. And keep in mind, there's 50,000 more students than there was. Every other agency has gone down 552 million dollars. So when you keep that in perspective, you, and you start looking at this, we have, they have been. Uh, when you, use, when you do accounting and government, you should be using generally accepted accounting principles. 
what I say they've been using, and Clark Valley started this, is creative representative county pencils. One's called GAF, one's called CRAP. <laughs> because because that, that's no form of accounting I've ever seen. We haven't had a budget since about 2013, a balanced budget. And so that being said, when you start looking at some of these issues, you know, gentlemen talked about corrections. We did an audit on corrections. And that audit and correction says, number one, is that our, we have too few guards, they're underpaid, the facilities are crumbling around them, and uh, their computer system is 30-something years old. They're, they're literally keeping track of people's uh, records and, and they're, they're for good behavior on paper. In many cases, they're, they're not getting it done correctly. We have people that are elderly that, sh that probably need to figure out a way to get them out because the older they are, the more their medical costs are. Yeah. So instead of being tough on crime and pretend to be tough on crime, we need to focus on being smart on crime. Yeah. You know, we don't have a Department of Corrections. <coughs> we, we have warehouses. We don't have programs to treat them. We don't have programs to get them educated so they can have a job when they come out. And then we need to start looking at diversion <coughs> projects that says, do we treat them for alcohol and drug and mental health, or do we put them in a warehouse and, and at, at $30,000 a year? That's right. Well, I, have, I have some questions, though. Sure. Number one, a lot of the money that's spent by the state government is kind of on autopilot, right? In other words, a lot of this expenditure is not, doesn't come under appropriated funds. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things like money goes to roads and bridges. There's certain money that's dedicated to, to uh, certain programs. And, okay. And My question to you is, should that process be reversed? In other words, should the, should, the, should the legislature actually appropriate every penny that comes into the state instead of having all these autopilot funds? There are certain funds that come into the state that are required to go to certain things. So when they appropriate it, <laughs> The legislature having control to appropriate money is the problem. The problem is, and this is what this is what I'm saying, if you do needs-based budgeting, you should look at every single source of revenue that comes in before you build that budget. And we ought to be doing individual budgets, not this omnibus budget thing. We ought to do an education budget. We ought to go through and fund that and look to see and make sure that we understand every single dollar that's coming in and see where every single dollar is going out. They talk about line item appropriations where they want to put... Line, well, yes, we should do line item appropriations, but we ought to do individual budgets. And then do them based on priority. And you ought to fund the top priorities. And then when you get down to where you have less money, you cut the low priorities. What we're doing now is we're cutting across the board. We're cutting high priority items. And, 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 and here's, here's the thing. Unless you go in and do that deep dive, I, I've seen people that come in and they have a budget that's $20 million when their actual expenditures are only twelve. And I went, this is crazy. I mean, when I first came into office, we had a $14 million budget and our spending was 10. The first budget I did, we were within $200,000 $200, on our budget. Now, when, when, and here's, here's the sad thing, what happens is, when the shortfall started coming, we started cutting. You know, Governor Fallon three years ago said we should reduce 10% of all the non-mission critical expenses out of government. I said, no. We should focus on eliminating 100% of all the non-mission critical expenses. You know, we don't have a chief of staff, a public relations person, a legislative liaison. We don't have any administrative assistance. We don't buy ink pens, we buy refills. We can renegotiate our water contract. I mean, and then of course what happens is we get ready for the shortfalls and we save a little money for the rainy day. What they do is they come back and say, hold it, you've got money in your, in your revolving fund. Well, that's our operating account. We have that money there because we've saved it getting ready for the shortfall. So they come back and say, we're going to cut your appropriations by 7%. Oh, yeah, by the way, you've got this money over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify this $500,000 you have here, and we're going to give you permission to spend it, like we didn't already have permission to spend our money because it came from audit services. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that amount off of your appropriations but not show it. So they, sh they told the public, and put it in the bill that they cut our appropriations by 7%, they cut it by 29%. They did the same thing to the Corporation Commission, they cut them, said by 5%, they actually cut them by 50% one year. You know these way stations that they have out here that are not manned? Because the money to man the way stations was put in a fund and the, the, the legislature robbed it. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Sure. Um, it seems that Oklahoma uh, relies on very unstable forms of tax uh, 
income. Do you have any thoughts about going to a different taxation system <coughs> that would be more stable? I mean, what, how could we do that? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what's happened. I said in the last 20 years, we've cut two billion dollars out of the revenue stream. The income tax used to be seven percent; it's now five percent. For every quarter cent reduction in the income tax is 160 million dollars. That's eight quarters is 1.28 billion. We took the gross production tax from seven percent down to two percent. And I tell you, when that happened. When a certain person cast the deciding vote, they got over a million dollars in campaign contributions because they did that. They also got a million dollars put into a private foundation that they run, which is wrong. So what we need to do is we need to do a reset on the gross production tax. I, last year came out with what I called the 555 plan. Mm -hmm. The income tax was at 5%. It was trigger, there was a trigger that would take it down to 4.85. We already had a huge shortfall. I said keep it at 5 and instead of having a 2% for the first three years, on oil and gas, and 7% after that, let's do 5% across the board. Once the price gets up to a certain level, go to 7 and put 1% in the Educational Stabilization Fund, put 1% in the Rainy Day Fund. If 5% is good enough for us, also, wind energy has gotten hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's put a 5% tax on generation of wind. <coughs> Other things, I know it's not popular with people in this room. I think that we ought to put it to a vote of the people to look at a tobacco tax. And I'll tell you why. Because the health-related items that we're paying for in the state of Oklahoma, a lot of them are tobacco-related. And what happens is if you get the $250 million that you can get from that, you can leverage part of our own money back from the federal government on a two-to-one ratio. So that gets you $750 million. So you want to use the tobacco tax for um, Health-related only. Only for health-related. And the reason being is, I've told you that the, the huge increase, 1.2 billion of that increase, are from health-related items. So let's put that there. The other thing is, and this, this is my plan I came out with, which is different than the step up. In fact, they took certain elements of my plan last year and put in the, the step up, but then increased them. On steroids. On steroids. <coughs> the cost of building a road and bridge today versus 30 years ago is four times as much. But the gasoline tax is the same. And the gasoline tax, when gasoline was a dollar a gallon, it's 17 cents on gasoline and 14 cents on diesel. Mm -hmm. what, what they're proposing is a six cent increase on gasoline, six cents on diesel. What I've said is I think we ought to think about a three cent increase on gasoline, a six cent on diesel, which makes it 20 cents across the board, but that money would be dedicated only for roads and bridges. You know, in, in 2000, well, so 2017, the legislature rated $200 million out of the highway fund mm -hmm. and then turned around and passed a bond issue mm -hmm. to put money back in. That's ridiculous. But we ought to have, you know, if we do that, the average family that drives 20,000 miles, would, uh, if you get 20 miles to the gallon, it costs you $2.50 a month. Well, but any time you increase fuel costs, you're, you're increasing the cost of every good and service you buy. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but, but, but what you're talking about, too, though, is that if you have a decline, and, and here, when the price of gasoline goes up to $4 a gallon, you actually get less money in taxes because people drive less. You know you know how you, could, you might sell that tax increase? How's that? Get rid of the turnpike. Yeah. Well, let me, okay, yeah. man, man, let, let, me, let me tell you this, the, the idea of getting rid of the turnpikes is it's a fallacy. It's never going to happen. It sounds good, it looks good on a poll, and I will tell you, I, I drive the turnpikes all the time, and the reason I say that is there is a billion dollars worth of bonds against the turnpikes. We get rid of the turnpikes, but what it's going to take is we're going to have to tax every man, woman, and child in the state of Oklahoma. Three hundred thirty-three dollars. Might as well start just saving the money now because we're losing millions and millions of corruption. Well, and, and and I will tell you that, that and yes, and here's the thing. I believe, and one of the first things I'll do is call for a performance audit, not a forensic audit, not a, a performance audit, to look to see whether or not we can save money with a combination of putting the Turnpike Authority and ODOT together to save money. You know, and and you know, there's the study that said it was done that says we should get rid of the Turnpikes. That study doesn't say that. 
What that study says is that we ought to sell the turnpikes to a private company. It doesn't say get rid of the tolls. But, 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 but here's what you have to do. You have to build that in so being irresponsible to go out there and put out the, the, the claim that we can do this and get people's hopes up when it can't be done. It's like, it's like selling the Grand River Dam Authority and making a, million, a billion dollars. We did an honor on the Grand River Dam Authority. If you sold the Grand River Dam Authority, you'd be good to pay off the bonds. But there's other things the Grand River Dam Authority does that provides the services for the lake, the patrols, and all that other stuff. So you have to take all those things in consideration. So sometimes I, I think I know too much. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because it, it might be real easy to come and tell you some things that aren't true to try to get your vote. But I'm not going to do that. And that's the problem we've got right now is too many politicians want to get out there and tell you things you want to hear. What you hear is, need to know is the truth. And the idea that an outsider can come in that doesn't know anything about that, I tell you what, I've never joined the fraternity. I've never drunk, drank the Kool-Aid. I've been the reformer. I've been the guy that they say, hey, we don't want to hear this guy because he's telling the truth and, he's, and, and the truth doesn't, doesn't support my, my, uh, my position. Yes, sir. One more question. Let's do one more, and then let's, and then um, we can hang out with you for a minute. Okay. I think that you're what would be termed a Condorcet winner, which, if you're not familiar with that term, it's a person, it's a candidate who, in a one-on-one -on -one race with every other candidate in the race, that you would come out ahead. I think at least four of the other five guys that. We, we have, you are, but, let me tell you, we have seen polling that says that we are number two on more people's ballot than anybody else. And what that means is if we make it to the runoff, we win. <clears throat> and I don't have any special interest groups. I've never had a special interest group other than citizens as a whole. I have people walk into my office all the time and said, you know what, we thought you were going to be the most partisan politician in the Capitol coming from being chairman. What they say is just the opposite. You're fair. You're fair, you're honest, and you treat everybody the same. I think that that's what, that's what Oklahoma wants. They want to be treated fairly, they want to be treated honestly, and they want somebody that will tell them the truth and not just blow smoke up their skirt to try to get elected. Well, let's go ahead yes. and then we'll wrap it up. The uh, Saturday and Sunday, the Faith co Coalitions would like to put Bible colleges in every prison at no charge, and they have been frozen out for 30 years. Well, and, and let me, this is one problem we've got right now in, in Oklahoma, is we're not allowing enough of the faith-based institutions to go in and help out, because that they, they, they provide a service that is drastically needed, and, and the prisoners need it, and it's, it, it actually helps bring down the cost. And so I think that's something we need to, we need to work towards. Them. So during this 30-year out. Islam has gone in <coughs> and has mm -hmm. uh, indoctrinated the inmates. And so you have that guy uh, taking a machete to a lady and he was... Uh, that, that is a problem and, and you're right. It's, uh, I think we need to, uh, need to allow more programs, e even before they get in there. There's a lot of the faith-based programs that will work with, with mm -hmm. people that go before they go into prison. And, and, and get them back on the right track, and then we need to work on uh, work on those. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think she's giving me the hook, yeah, and I'll be around so. to answer any questions you might so, have. Thank so. you. Thank you.